Welcome to today's ABP webinar event, Unlocking U.S. Funding for Africa Projects. I am Lee Clegg, President of the Africa Business Portal, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. We are so happy today to have Rashonda Johnson of OPIC, David Raposo of USTDA, and Bed Todd of Exim Bank as our panelists. Each comes with in-depth knowledge of their organizations and of Africa, and uh, I'll let each of them briefly introduce themselves, if they would, and we're just thrilled to have you, and this will be a wonderful event. Thanks, thanks Lee. This is Rashonda. It's good to be here, and I just want to say thank you for the invitation to participate. OPIC is an independent U.S. government agency that got its start in 1971. We are the U.S. Government's Development Finance Institution. As the U.S. Government's Development Finance Institution, our mission is to mobilize private capital to address critical development challenges and in doing so advance U.S. foreign policy and national security. David? Uh, David Raposo with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Uh, USTDA for 30 years has been investing in uh, infrastructure projects in priority markets uh, around the world, including in Africa. Um, our goal is to uh, provide grant funding to uh, priority infrastructure projects uh, to help uh, facilitate um, the, the shepherding of those projects from the conception stage to a stage where they will be bankable, ready to approach uh, people like uh, Exim Bank and OPIC for, for financing. I'm very excited to talk to you today about our work in power, uh, telecommunications, and, and transportation, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to work together in the future. And Ben. Great. Thank you, Lee, um, and thank you, Africa Business Portal, for, for putting this together. This is a fantastic thing when the troika of U.S. agencies gets together to talk about financing in Africa. Uh, my name is uh, Benjamin Todd. I've been with Exim Bank for almost 10 years now. Um, I've done credit underwriting in the past, and now I, I oversee Africa and the Middle East for the bank as far as business development efforts are concerned. Exim Bank is the U.S. government's official export credit agency and our mission is to create and sustain U.S. jobs by financing exports um, and it's important to note that we do that at no cost to the taxpayer. We actually make money which pays for not only my salary and the lights on here at the building at, at Exim Bank but also um, brings money back to the Treasury. So I look forward to talking to everybody and uh, have, uh, hopefully this will be a good productive hour. We'll now go into a little bit about each organization. Rashonda, how strong is OPIC's commitment to Africa, and what are the major services you provide in Africa? Great. Thanks for the question, Lee. So Africa has long been a key area of focus for OPIC investment. Um, presently, OPIC manages a portfolio worth $21.5 billion. More than one quarter of that portfolio includes commitments in Africa. The projects encompass critical infrastructure, agriculture, health, education, hospitality, microfinance, oil and gas. We also support uh, franchises and some other sectors that contribute to sustainable economic development. OPIC offers three primary products to assist American companies entering markets in Africa. And we do this by providing um, financing. Uh, political risk insurance, and then we also support the investment fund. Um, for investors who are concerned with accessing capital, you can um, check out our finance program, and through that program we provide direct loans as well as guarantees to overseas that ventures. We can lend 50 to 75 percent of the total project cost. The remaining we will look to the sponsor to contribute in the form of equity. Um, we can finance a minimum loan size of $500,000 and a maximum loan size of $250 million. Um, for investors who are interested in managing political risk, OPIC has a political risk insurance product that, pro, um, that protects investors' assets abroad if there are losses due to various political events like currency and convertibility, political violence, and also expropriation. 
Ben, let me ask a similar question. How strong is the Exim Bank commitment to Africa and why, and what are the major services you provide? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned uh, in the intro, um, Exim Bank is the U.S. government's official export credit agency. Um, and what we do is we finance U.S. exports where there is a lack of private sector financing. Um, our commitment to Africa is very strong. In fact, Exim Bank has a congressional mandate to do more in Africa. Um, there's a dedicated team of two um, that tries to drive more business to the continent from a business development perspective. Um, and historically, as far as intensity of support, um, Exim has covered around 8% of exports to Sub-Saharan Africa compared to uh, less than 2% in other regions of the world. Um, no business, no U.S. business is too small or too large uh, for us to, to consider. Um, in fact, most of our activity is with small businesses and helping them um, export to Africa, uh, as well as other regions around the world. As far as our major services, um, we have uh, several different products, um, but I will touch on the four main products that we have. First is working capital, and this is open to U.S. businesses only. And this is where Exim Bank can guarantee a bank's loan to a U.S. exporter to facilitate an export order. So let's say you're a piping company that needs to purchase some steel piping materials in order to bend it and shape it and export it out. We can provide a guarantee to a bank that would be let that that would be lending to your business, so that you can get the working capital necessary uh, for uh, the completion of a major export order. Our next product is uh, export credit insurance. Again, this is available for U.S. exporters, but is very beneficial for buyers overseas. In this case, African buyers. Um, Export credit insurance is a pretty standard trade finance tool, and that's where Exim Bank can ensure a U.S. company's receivable that they extend overseas uh, to a buyer. And uh, we take on essentially the political and commercial risk of the buyer, giving comfort to the U.S. company that's selling on open account terms. Uh, this can be used to avoid costly letters of credit and also for a U.S. company that's trying to win a order can offer credit terms to their buyer against our insurance rather than requesting cash in advance. For um, longer tenors, we, we can do commercial uh, loan guarantees. And these are where Exim Bank guarantees a loan to an overseas buyer that's purchasing U.S. goods and services. So let's say a, a, there's an agricultural company in Africa that is looking at, to purchase um, some, some combines and, and other uh, pivot irrigations. We could organize a, a facility to that buyer so that they can purchase the uh, goods and services from the U.S. company. And lastly, we also have a direct loan product. Um, this is kind of a last resort product and is typically for large ticket items that have longer tenors, for example, for renewable energy products, uh, we, can, we can consider terms of up to 18 years. But this is where Exim Bank would actually uh, organize a, a loan from the U.S. government to a buyer that is purchasing U.S. goods and services. Very similar to the previous loan guarantee product, it's just that the funding entity differs. Thank you. So David, with respect to U.S. TDA, what are the major services you provide U.S. companies doing business in Africa? And again, what are the major services you provide African firms supporting U.S. businesses? Uh, U.S. TDA engages with uh, U.S. businesses and with African businesses in somewhat of a unique manner. Uh, what we will do is identify uh, prospective grantees either through periodic calls for proposals or through direct solicitations that African, or in this case African, but, but throughout the emerging uh, markets of the world, um, African businesses will, will send us uh, proposals on a rolling basis throughout the year. And once we identify a grantee, we will collaboratively develop a proposal, uh, or excuse me, a, a terms of reference document, which will um, help 
the, the venture in question um, uh, sort of move along the development life cycle from a conception stage to a stage where it's ready to approach investors um, and um, achieve financial close. Um, typically, that terms of reference document uh, will include a feasibility study and all of the attendant uh, environmental, legal, and uh, engineering documentation associated with a feasibility study. Um, the scope of work itself, the technical services that our grant funding supports, uh, will always be conducted by a U.S. business. So to be clear, the grantee in this case, um, uh, when engaging with USTDA, is always an African enterprise. Uh, the technical services provider, though, will always be a U.S. business. Uh, the Black & Veatch, uh, Tetra Tech, uh, AE, the uh, AECOMs of the world, these are the technical services providers that help our grantees uh, sort of realize their development vision. Um, so that's our bread and butter product. We do a lot of project preparation work, uh, uh, working directly with uh, uh, ventures and emerging markets um, to help prepare projects for bankability. But in addition to that, uh, we also sponsor from time to time uh, conferences and workshops. For example, recently in Nairobi, uh, last uh, winter in Nairobi, we sponsored a conference uh, convening hundreds of mini-grid operators from around uh, Africa, East and West, and discussed uh, standards uh, for interoperability among many different kinds of, of technologies, um, and uh, also market trends that uh, different entrepreneurs were encountering in their respective country contexts. Uh, we sponsor from time to time technical assistance, which is often targeted directly at governments. Um, sometimes we will sponsor embedded advisors to uh, inform uh, procurement uh, processes, for example, um, to help make the case for uh, best value procurement, uh, which is often a, a variety of procurement that will help to advantage U.S. businesses. Um, finally, we sponsor uh, reverse trade missions, which are similar to the trade missions that are sponsored by the Department of Commerce and with which you might be familiar. Um, however, re in reverse trade missions, uh, we will take a delegation of African executives to uh, the United States where they will have the opportunity to tour um, for example, uh, 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 energy storage facilities. They will come to have an intimate understanding at the conclusion of a reverse trade mission, the relative uh, merits of U.S. technology in uh, the energy storage sector, let's say. And for example, um, this week, as we speak, uh, we have a delegation of Nigerian executives from the gas to power industry who are presently in Houston, Texas, learning more about the, uh, the, the merits of of U.S. technology in that domain relative to so many of our competitors. Um, and my understanding is that uh, 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 Mr. Todd from Exim Bank uh, just returned from uh, Houston where he was joining that delegation and discussing um, uh, financing options with uh, some of the executives in attendance. I consider that to be a good example of uh, interagency collaboration and, and the extent to which we all really work together in the course of export promotion and, and uh, development impact. Ben, how would you contrast the services of OPEC, Exxon Bank, and USTDA? And we'll give Rashonda and David a chance to comment on that as well. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lee. Um, well, first I would have to say I don't want to contrast it first. I want to, I want to talk about how we have a shared goal in that we are, we're all trying to drive, as it says, um, exports and investment to Africa. And so um, we each play a, a critical role. Um, in in making that happen, so TDA US TDA and and again I, I defer to to David uh, who's given you much more color on it, um, but they're the agency that's really at the uh, at the front end in the project preparation phase. Um, any type of application for for finance, uh, Exim Bank does debt finance as does OPIC as well. You know requires good bankable feasibility studies. And, and project preparation that's necessary for us to undertake our due diligence. You know, we neither Exim nor OPIC are really in the um, grant making phase where to as provide that type of uh, initial almost developmental equity to um, to 
to prepare these types of studies. And so TDA plays a critical role. Also where TDA plays a, a critical role too is, um, as they mentioned in the reverse trade missions in matchmaking. So having um, uh, African companies meet U.S. companies and vice versa. So brokering those critical relationships um, that are necessary for Exim Bank and OPIC to undertake their respective missions. Now, where does it go from there? Well, this slide um, uh, pretty much uh, is, is is extremely basic, but it but it cuts right to the point. Exim Bank is typically tied to U.S. exports, whereas OPIC is tied to U.S. investment. And so, if you have a project over in Africa um, that um, is is let's say an African company or a government, and they are purchasing hard goods or services um, from the U.S., um, then Exim Bank can provide financing um, for that is tied to the purchase of those U.S. goods and services. OPIC, on the other hand, if there's a, a private project where there's a significant investor dollars from the U.S. being put into that project, they can provide political risk insurance to that equity investment, as well as provide debt to that entity as well for their growth. So that essentially is, is how we all work together. Um, we're always on panels together, <laughs> like this one. We uh, we definitely work together on things such as Power Africa and other U.S. government uh, initiatives as well. Well, thank you for that explanation, Ben. Um, I, I believe that this slide in a way uh, recasts the, the information that, that you just stated and, and presents it in a, in a similar but, um, uh, but, but distinct way, which, which I think is important. Um, what this slide expresses that perhaps the, the previous one doesn't is that um, the, the evaluation criteria of, of US TDA and, and XM Bank are really quite similar. Um, in, in our own ways, we are interested in sponsoring uh, ventures which uh, support um, ultimately uh, uh, U.S. exports. In, in TDA's case, uh, we would like to understand, um, you know, at the very outset of the, of the project development life cycle, that um, the opportunity that we're considering extending grant funding to has the potential to support uh, U.S. exports at the end of that development journey. Um, Exim Bank really will will enter the equation at the end of the at the of the project preparation uh, life cycle and support that enterprise in order to facilitate those uh, U.S. exports. Uh, we work with OPIC um, just as regularly, though, um, as, as Exim Bank. Um, because a project has uh, a U.S. investor, um, that doesn't in any way preclude it from having uh, U.S. export content as well, quite the opposite, really, in, in so many instances. And, and so uh, we work with uh, both OPIC and Exim on a, on a regular basis. Um, as you think about uh, sort of the, the distinction between these ag agencies, um, uh, think about, uh, you know, what, what Ben has said in, in terms of uh, U.S. TDA being involved in, in those early stages of the project um, development life cycle, both OPIC and XM being involved in the fundraising phase. But OPIC really being focused on opportunities where there is a, a, a key um, a U.S. equity uh, stakeholder, and XM being oriented towards providing debt finance to those projects where there is a, an opportunity for uh, U.S. exports that has been demonstrated. Great. And just to add on to what Ben and David said, uh, another distinguishing mark is that um, OPIC mission focuses on promoting international development overseas uh, by financing or insuring U.S. companies um, with investments abroad. And we focus on low to middle income countries. And so um, I think I may have mentioned earlier that we service over 150 countries that are spread across uh, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. But the focus is on low to middle income countries. Now we get a chance to ask about how we maximize funding opportunities with each of your organizations. Uh, starting with David, what's the difference between companies who effectively utilize your services and those who don't? And uh, I think we have time. If there's a success story in those areas you'd like to share, feel free to do that as well, David. 
Sure, thank you, Lee. Um, uh, I, I believe that really all of the, the grantees with, with whom we've engaged um, are utilizing our, our services quite effectively. I'm, I'm proud of, of the work that we're doing, for example, with a portfolio of about 60 uh, grantees in Sub-Saharan Africa alone that are pursuing uh, power projects um, in at least uh, 14 countries right now. And the reason why uh, we see such strong performance among our grantees is because, in large part, our vetting procedures are so robust. Uh, we receive, uh, it's tough to say, but approximately 100 applications for funding for each uh, opportunity that we fund. Um, and so we do subject uh, each of our grantees to a lot of, uh, a lot of vetting and due diligence um, up front. Now, all that being said, uh, our grantees so often, um, and, and so many people on the call as well, are operating in, in some of the, the world's most challenging uh, enabling environments, uh, some of the world's most challenging uh, uh, marketplaces in, in order to uh, achieve some of these uh, infrastructure development goals. And so things happen. Uh, things happen that are well beyond the, the control of our grantees and that are difficult to foresee at the, at the project outset. We found that the developers who are, who are best positioned uh, to be able to pilot through um, some of those uncertainties as their, uh, as their development process unfolds are the developers who are actively engaged in trying to allay risk right at the outset of their projects. Uh, they're engaging with, with people like Roshanda, uh, for example, uh, organizations like OPIC, um, and thinking about, uh, for example, political risk coverages um, just as the development life cycle is, is getting underway. Um, because the end result, the desired end result of our grant assistant, uh, assistance is always a bankable project, so a project that can seek uh, public and, and private uh, debt and equity, uh, we found also that successful ventures are um, eagerly and uh, uh, engaging investors um, early in their project development life cycle in a substantive way, um, if in in a formal way. Um, they're having conversations with bankers about um, what uh, the criteria are, uh, what will the project need to look like however many years from now in order for it to be regarded favorably by the investment community. These are the kinds of questions that successful grantees are, are asking right at the outset of their projects. And in terms of success stories, uh, Lee, that, that was your final question. Um, we have uh, you know, a, a growing number of those these days. I, I would say that um, uh, one that I'll call out um, right now is a, um, a small solar project. This is a five megawatt solar project, which is presently under construction in uh, western Tanzania, uh, which once it's complete will be the largest uh, solar installation tied to an isolated mini-grid anywhere in the world. Quite a novel facility in terms of grid integration. Uh, the reason I like this project so much, um, not just because it will you know, electrify 16,000 households and um, uh, present uh, a really interesting data set about the integration of variable power on isolated grids, uh, but because of the uh, extent of cooperation uh, between OPIC and uh, USTDA along the way. Um, this is a project that is being constructed with local debt, um, a debt that was uh, raised locally and, and is quite expensive. And uh, as a consequence of that, although the project is under construction presently, uh, the developer is already looking at opportunities to refinance. Um, and so they've opened up conversations with uh, Rashonda's colleague, uh, colleagues on the, um, on the Africa team. Uh, to explore what might be possible um, in terms of a refinance package uh, after commercial delivery, which we expect in the coming uh, months, probably circa June. Well, thank you, David. And Rashonda, the same question. What's the difference between companies who effectively utilize your services and those that don't? And if there's a success story you'd like to share, feel free to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. So U.S. companies that are successful in using OPIC services um, they not only meet our basic eligibility requirements, which include having a commercially viable business, having a track record, having a U.S. nexus, doing business in a country that OPIC is actively investing in, 
et cetera. Um, but they also understand that OPIC is obligated to ensure projects that confer on the host economies and communities a um, as many positive developmental benefits as, as possible. Um, in terms of a success story, there's, there's quite a few, um, but one that sticks out in my mind is a um, private equity investment fund that OPIC supported in Tunisia. And this fund um, find, or invested in a woman-owned manufacturer of feminine and baby hygiene products. And what that investment did is it helped that business expand its customer base into 17 countries in Africa while also growing its employee base to about 2,000 people and adding plants in other um, neighboring countries like Algeria and, and Libya. Thank you so much, Rashada. And Ben, the same question. How do you see those organizations that take advantage of Exum and those that don't? And, uh, and a success story, if you'd like to share. Great. Thanks, Lee. Um, as I mentioned, um, Exim Bank, we, we provide financing for, for all sorts of U.S. businesses. Um, they, they can be, uh, most of them are small businesses, obviously medium and large size businesses as well. Um, what really makes uh, Exim Bank uh, work well with U.S. businesses are those businesses that um, have a defined export strategy. They're not you know, trying to do just a one-off sale and, and, and walk away. Those that we like to say that it's kind of part of their company's DNA. And this is whether you're, you're a small business that's, that's exporting some widgets to, you know, a large business um, selling commercial aircraft. Um, if, it's, if, it's a, if exporting is, is in your strategic plan for revenue growth, then definitely have a, a lot of success. Also, um, working with uh, viable partners, uh, be it partners on the ground in Africa um, that, that are trustworthy, um, having uh, you know, sound legal advice as well is, is uh, rather important because there are a number of legal issues that need to be um, navigated when you're doing cross-border sales. Um, and also companies that have a strong track record, just like with OPIC and TDA, um, you know, it it's, can be a bit more difficult for Exim Bank to work with startups um, and typically we work with companies that have a, a, a defined track record of success that are looking at expanding into new markets or expanding their sales volume in existing markets. Now, Exim Bank, you know, we have we also have a number of success stories. Well, let me let me point out two here. Um, recently in Cameroon, we've done a, a number of transactions, but one in particular stands out um, uh, very well, and that's with a, a company called Acro Bridge. Uh, they're a U.S. small business out of New Jersey, and uh, they were selling a number of bridges uh, to, to Cameroon, and they were being purchased by the government of Cameroon, and Exim Bank, through the uh, French Bank Société Générale, provided a 15-year facility to the Cameroonian government for the purchase of these bridges um, so that they can be installed and, and literally <laughs> help bridge uh, that country and, and a lot of the... Um, uh, crossings that otherwise were, uh, didn't have bridges. Um, we've also uh, done quite a bit, uh, as I mentioned, in the small business space in Africa. One story in particular is a, a cosmetics company out of Los Angeles that um, started off uh, selling, asking for cash in advance to various countries across Africa. And Exim Bank uh, was approached, and, and we currently provide um, a multi-million dollar facility that covers all of their receivables book that they extend to Africa um, such that it gives them comfort, uh, one, that if for some reason a transaction does go awry that there is Exim Bank there insuring their receivables, but also it, it avoids them from seeking costly letters of credit from businesses in Africa, which sometimes, you know, are maybe on the medium or smaller size as well, which don't want to go through the, the, the collateralization requirements and everything like that that's required to, to uh, have a, a bank issue an LC on their behalf. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is one great way to get to know how to work with Exim Bank is 
coming to our annual conference. Um, Eggs and Banks annual conference is next week, actually, April 6th and 7th here in Washington, D.C. Um, and the, our website has more information, www.exim.gov. We'll be covering all sorts of topics, do, doing deep dives on all of Exim Bank's products, as well as opportunities uh, to export not only in Africa, but other regions of the world as well. So hopefully some of you all can register, and I'll see you at our conference next week. Thank you. And for each of you, what is the best way for someone to access your services? And they can have each of you cover that, and starting with Rashonda. Okay, great. So the best way to um, access OPIC services is to contact an OPIC officer. And uh, on your screen, you should see my contact information, but I'm happy to discuss any projects that um, you may have. Um, that you think would be a good fit for OPIC. Even if you don't think so, it's fine to reach out to us and we can definitely offer you some feedback and give you some guidance on, um, on how your project can fit within OPIC or another U.S. government agency. Thank you. And uh, next, David, would you like to comment? Sure, um, I can comment. Um, yeah, the, 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 uh, there are two uh, principal ways to engage with uh, USTDA. Uh, we do issue periodic calls for proposals, um, and those are on our, our website. Um, so the, the uh, one way to approach this is to just monitor our website uh, just by setting up an RSS feed. Um, uh, However, we are um, open to um, unsolicited proposals on a rolling basis uh, throughout the year. Um, if you have a concept which um, broadly meets our criteria, and I should mention um, just to put in a plug for the handouts pane, which, which I understand is to the right side of your screen, um, you can find more information about our criteria. Um, if you feel that your venture aligns with those, um, send us a concept note, not too detailed, not even necessarily including a budget, but just a high-level overview of, of what you envision. Um, we can work with you to help you understand whether it's a good fit for the tools that, that we have to offer. Um, in terms of who your best point of contact is, uh, we have a, a staff of uh, approximately 10 uh, here on the Sub-Saharan Africa team alone. Rather than list all of them, um, I've just provided my uh, email address um, here on the screen. Um, if you would like to start that conversation, uh, start it with me, and either I can help you address uh, whatever questions you may have, or I can get you to the people that can. Ben, would you like to come? Um, so I would say, uh, for, for moving your funding forward with Exim Bank, by all means, uh, contact me if you have any questions. There's my contact info. Email is typically best because I'm, I'm um, not behind my desk that often. Um, but, you know, if you wish to call, call me. We also have a number of uh, representative offices across the U.S. Um, and again, our website, www.exim.gov, um, lists those different locations. They're on the West Coast, the East Coast, Midwest, Texas, um, the South. Um, so, by all means, uh, those can be also um, uh, different uh, places and resources that you could look at as well. The actual application process differs depending on the products. Um, and typically, if you're looking at our short-term insurance products, that's driven through insurance brokers that, again, are listed on our website, where they can, they can act as uh, packagers and package the various information that's needed for an application that our credit officers can then underwrite. Um, if you're looking for working capital, that's typically done through delegated authority lenders that we have across the U.S. Again, there's a list of those on our website where you can go to um, uh, you can go to uh, the delegated authority lenders, and they basically again package and get everything approved, and then they would be the funding bank that would be funding to your business against our our guarantee um, for larger projects. The um, larger capital equipment projects like the um, Cameroon bridge transaction I mentioned earlier. Um, 
that is uh, those those are typically uh, much more robust. Um, and in that instance, the lending bank, which was Societe Generale, was kind of the the contact for the exporter as well as Exim Bank. Um, but to get that process started, one can apply for letters of interest with Exim Bank as well. And those uh, letters of interest, they're non-binding, but they set out our general terms and conditions. But I would say contact me. It would be the best way to, to, to start things off. Thank you. I want to thank each of the panelists for your insights so far, and we'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions from the audience. And our first question is, uh, there's a number number that uh, are asking about uh, country-specific questions. Uh, how do we, how do you, how would you explain how they would determine what the country-specific limitations are for your organization? And we also have people in Europe and Africa that are wondering, does this apply to me uh, since this is uh, U.S. funding? Start with uh, Ben, if you could. Certainly. So Exim Bank, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of country risk appetite. Um, on our website, um, www.exim.gov, we have something called the Country Limitation Schedule, and that sets out, uh, that lists every country in the world. Um, including our our appetite, uh, our tenor appetite for that particular country, whether we're open short term, which is under a year, medium term, which is under uh, five years, or long term, which can be up to 18 year tenors. Um, and a, a good proxy to our risk appetite is, is the, the, the credit rating of a particular country as well. Um, but I invite anybody to go look at our country limitation schedule and that's where um, it kind of sets out um, what our our appetite is. Now, as far as non-U.S. companies, um, you know, this is it. Exim Bank provides uh, debt finance, so it's it's not it, it is funding per se, but it's debt finance for um, overseas businesses that are purchasing U.S. goods and services. That is a big part of our portfolio. It's not our only part. Again, we do have our working capital and insurance. But providing debt finance to, to buyers of U.S. goods and services um, is, is a, a, not only a direct benefit to the U.S. companies that are selling products to those markets, but also any entity that is involved with those companies because their cost of capital goes down quite a bit when, when they uh, get a successful exit bank backed facility. So we've I've seen a number of these companies have sponsors and shareholders that are out of Europe, uh, that are out of Asia, that are out of Africa. Um, and so obviously those sponsors and equity investors benefit whenever the cost of capital is lowered. So um, while yes our mission is directly tied to US exporters and US companies, there's a lot of ancillary benefits um, for companies that aren't in, located in the U.S. as well. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, in terms of OPIC in the countries that we operate in, we operate in low to middle income countries, and OPIC defines that by a company that has, I'm, I'm sorry, a country that has a per capita income of $15,000 or less. So if the country does not fall into that category, most likely OPIC is not investing in that country. We have a full list on our website of the countries that we are authorized to invest in, but the best way to find out if the country that you're interested in investing in um, is available for OPIC support is to reach out to an OPIC office like myself and we can get you that information. Um, we support overseas projects. So as long I mean, as long as there is a in the project, OPIC could potentially get involved. So that would be something else that you would just reach out to an OPIC officer and really get some more details on. And David, the same question? In terms of, of country limitations, uh, USTDA is, is only slightly different uh, than than both Exim and, and OPIC in that we don't have we don't publish uh, specific limitations by country. Uh, that said, 
if we're overexposed or, or our executive uh, leadership uh, perceives that we're overexposed in a, a certain market, it will be challenging for us to continue to go there. Um, and as a consequence, that will inform um, sometimes the, the viability of, of, a, of a given proposal. But we do not publish uh, specific uh, country limitations. Uh, right now, we're, we're open for business throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with the exception, as, as Rashonda has noted, of uh, countries that fall outside that, that low to middle income threshold. And I just recall that, that we're only in the business of, of extending this kind of grant support to uh, low to middle income um, countries. Uh, in terms of European companies, um, I'll note that um, uh, first and foremost, uh, USTDA is, uh, has been chartered to support U.S. Uh, businesses. We, we want to support enterprises that at the, at the end um, of the development process will uh, support U.S. manufacturing, that, that is manufacturing in the U.S. If, let's say, uh, the manufacturing is of a GE turbine that happens to be built in the Middle East, then that would not qualify as, as uh, U.S. manufacturing. Um, however, if, the, if it's a Siemens turbine that is manufactured in Ohio, uh, potentially that, that could be uh, uh, very interesting to us. Um, so there are lots of instances like that throughout our portfolio where we're supporting uh, uh, the European companies in, in that example uh, who are doing their manufacturing in the U.S. and then exporting to, uh, to Africa. From our perspective, that would be a win for U.S. manufacturing. Thank you, David. And, and the next question for uh, uh, Rashonda and Ben is, uh, how do your interest rates compare with other financing options on the continent? Great. So um, in regard to OPIC, our rates are based on the U.S. Treasury note of a similar tenure at the time of disbursement. And then OPIC adds a risk spread on to that. Um, you know, we leverage the fact that we are able to offer competitive rates in comparison to other entities and also that we're able to provide longer tenure. So those rates, I just want to make a note that those rates are negotiable. So at the time that you submit a project and it's assigned to a project team, they will then negotiate the interest rate with you. And Ben? Great. It, it, it's always very tough to kind of um, quote specific interest rates and, and, and premiums and things like that. But let me just give um, a, a ballpark. And the best way to do that is, is try to measure it against a benchmark. Um, this morning, I was reading that Nigeria, for example, Nigeria is a single B-rated country. The government of Nigeria issued another 15-year, $500 million euro bond with a yield of 7.5%. Now, the reason why that's that's a, a good benchmark is because one, it just happened, and two, it's 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 a dollar-based euro bond, and so that's what the Nigerian government for 15 years is looking at funding, uh, uh, at least some infrastructure opportunities that they're looking at. Exim Bank, as an export credit agency, if we were to uh, organize a direct loan facility to the government of Nigeria for 15 years, uh, likely our rate would fall around five and a half, six percent all in. Um, and that's basically calculated off of what our lending rate is allowed under um, what's called the OECD consensus on export credits, as well as the risk premium we would charge for a single B market um, in uh, for just a single B market. Again, um, all all rates and, and all fees are, are uh, subject to, to credit committee, our CFO and, and, and board approval, but notionally that's what you could look at uh, for something in, in a country that has a similar risk profile as, as Nigeria. Now our short-term insurance is, is, a, is a risk premium that we typically add on um, to cover for um, the risks that we undertake in our short-term export credit insurance. And that can be anything if it's, let's say, a, a 30 or 60-day receivable, might see um, a flat um, 75 basis point to 100 basis point charge if a receivable is being extended to a, 
uh, a country that's again maybe a single B risk profile. So in general, that's what it is. On our website, all of our pricing is it's fully transparent for both our short term as well as our medium and long term, and also indicative interest rates for just our direct loan products because. Um, similar to OPIC, the, the guaranteed loan product, the actual interest rate itself would be set by the, the, the funding bank that is funding the transaction against our guarantee. Next question, uh, I'll broaden the question a little bit that's being asked and ask you what is your commitment to agricultural projects and, and do you do funding for agricultural projects in various countries in Africa? And maybe start with uh, Rashonda. Okay, great. Thanks, Lee. So OPIC is very keen to support agriculture projects and, and projects in Africa in, in particular. Um, you know, there's a project that recently just came across my desk that is being looked at favorably. And um, it's a project that involves a, um, ch um, this, this company, um, does primary agriculture. And so one of the things that OPIC is, would look for in that situation in order to determine um, if we're going to direct our resources there is, you know, is it a product, I mean, I'm sorry, is it a project that the sponsor has at least two to three years of operation and also can demonstrate revenue generation? Um, our agriculture, um, you know, the agriculture sector, just because of the risk, you know, we look at that sector. The way we look at the sector is um, a little bit more strict in comparison to some of the other sectors, but um, we're definitely keen to support those projects, and, you know, we welcome you to send us any proposals that you have uh, around agriculture. Wonderful. And uh, David, maybe you'd like to comment? Well, candidly, we haven't had a lot of success in the agriculture domain in the recent past in Africa. And the simple reason is because um, many ventures aren't structured as, as infrastructure projects. Uh, foremost, we are an infrastructure uh, uh, project promotion agency. Uh, we always want to, um, you know, assist with that particular uh, uh, flavor of, of project development. Um, and so many of the proposals for uh, for agriculturally oriented projects don't really align well with that mandate. Um, in the last uh, several years, uh, for example, uh, one agricultural uh, engagement that we've had, which I, I think was very successful, was a reversed uh, trade mission that we conducted uh, four or five years ago, um, uh, whereby we took a number of executives from throughout the industry, it was um, Africa-wide, not country-specific, and uh, toured them over the course of about two weeks. We took them on a tour of uh, several uh, uh, manufacturers uh, throughout the U.S. of um, industrial-scale uh, agricultural equipment. We haven't done much um, in the intervening years, um, but uh, we'll entertain the proposals without doubt. Um, if there's anyone on the line that, that has a, a venture that you know is in that domain and you think that it might otherwise align with our criteria, um, we'd definitely be interested in, in uh, taking a look at it. Well, and Ben, would you like to comment on that? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> well, not the largest component of our portfolio, Exim Bank has supported a number of um, agricultural uh, uh, products globally as well as in Africa. I can, I can remember in particular in Africa we've supported everything from um, crop dusters that were being exported by, by U.S. companies, pivot irrigation systems, um, uh, commercial combines, um, grain storage. Um, even uh, specialized seeds and fertilizers under our export credit insurance. And actually, my very favorite that we once supported, this was in North Africa, Morocco, was um, pregnant cattle. And so I always wondered why they were pregnant cattle. And the exporter told me because it's uh, you get, get a twofer on your shipping costs, which didn't even think about that. But... Um, so we've done quite a bit. Um, similar to what Rashonda said, um, certainly you know we would look at our counterparty risk and make sure that it is it is a risk that um, 
uh, is comfortable. Um, agricultural risk is um, is can be different than others in that the revenue generation, depending on the number of planting seasons, is very very lumpy. Um, but we have done it before, and and I would love to hear about any projects that would be looking to source from the U.S. Um, in the ag sector. Well, wonderful. And uh, one other question for each of you is. Uh, that I can see that in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Anglophone countries you have some, some activities. What about the Francophone countries? And maybe uh, start with uh, Rashonda again. Okay. So again, OPIC is um, open to invest in about 150 countries, uh, low to middle income countries, that is, across Africa, uh, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and we're also um, open in Eastern Europe as well. So I, I think the best way to find out if the country that you're interested in is somewhere that OPIC is currently um, supporting is to just reach out to an OPIC officer. Um, we also have our list of countries on our website, but it's always best to reach out to an officer because sometimes um, just depending on the environment, for example, our exposure in a particular country, we may not be actively investing in a country that is listed on our website. So, yeah, just reach out to an OPIC officer. All right, wonderful. And uh, David and Ben, I assume you're committed to Francophone countries as well? Yeah, that's that's correct. This is this is David, and, and I can comment on that. Uh, certainly, we're we're agnostic to language, uh, French, Portuguese, English. We are um, active in in uh, all of those markets uh, around the continent. Uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, we uh, entered into an agreement with a U.S. company that is eager to um, extend their the reach of their mini grid. Um, uh, uh, development activities in Senegal. Uh, they have a concession for a large swath of the northern part of, of Senegal and, and through our funding uh, we will be helping them sort of establish the, the feasibility of, of expansion throughout that territory. Um, that's one example but there are several others uh, in our power portfolio but, but around our portfolio. Uh, we're just as eager to sponsor activities in, in Francophone Africa as, uh, as elsewhere in Africa. This has been uh, at Eximbank. Certainly, I mean, we we are we are agnostic as well as far as as language is concerned. We support projects uh, again all over the globe, um, uh, no matter whether it's you know in Africa, Anglophone, Lusophone, or Francophone. Um, the the one thing that I will say is you know, and, and to stress it, it as much as possible, is Exim Bank, we finance U.S. exports. So if there's no exports going to a particular country, it's difficult for us to get involved. We do not, we do not uh, negotiate commercial contracts. We do not do matchmaking. We are, we, we are there to finance a sale that where financing um, is needed because the private sector isn't there. So when you look at U.S. exports towards Africa, they do tend to favor Anglophone uh, countries over Francophone countries, but that's changing. Um, you know, I've seen more and more U.S. businesses get involved in countries like Cameroon, which I mentioned before, with countries like Angola, with Mozambique, with uh, Cote d'Ivoire, with Senegal. So, um, you know, and, and, and I of course very much welcome that because uh, the more U.S. exports that are going to Africa, the more more opportunities for Exim Bank to assist those companies expanding their sales, uh, whether it's in Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, or Lusophone Africa. The last question is kind of one that I think has been somewhat addressed, but uh, over 80% of businesses in Nigeria, and I might say in all of Africa, fall within the classification of small and medium-sized enterprise. Does this category of business qualify for your funding support in any way? Ben, you want to start with that? Sure. Um, we have financed businesses of all sizes um, in in Africa. Um, we've financed um, small businesses, medium and large size. Basically, for us, um, when Exim Bank is supporting a U.S. exporter and are being asked to take on the commercial risk 
of a company in Africa, we will do a, a credit due diligence on that particular company. Um, if it's a larger size transaction, this means looking for things like audited financial statements so that we can make a, a solid and judicious uh, credit assessment. Uh, for smaller transactions, um, for example, if we're doing a, I mentioned in my success stories, um, uh, cosmetics, we've done transactions for, you know, $50,000 in U.S. cosmetics um, that are going to a particular uh, buyer in Nigeria. It was a I would say a medium-sized company in Nigeria. Um, all we needed was a trade reference, credit reference, um, and the U.S. exporter's ledger uh, performance with that particular exporter in, in the past. And so we were able to render a credit decision with that. So it really depends upon the size and the complexity. Um, one of the things that we do look at is uh, size, scope, and scale and whether the parties involved, whether they're, they're, they're both the U.S. exporter as well as the buyer have participated in transactions of similar size, scope, and scale before because, again, you know, we're, we're a lending institution. We're, we're, not, we're not here to provide um, angel investment or, or, um, or uh, other types of uh, initial equity investment. We're here to, to, to provide debt and, and other financial products in order to, to make U.S. exporters feel more comfortable in selling stuff into, um, into Africa in this case. And I think that that applies to everyone, and David as well, uh, and Rashonda on the small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, this is this is David, and, and I can I can go ahead. Um, uh, yes, that's that's correct. Uh, over the years, uh, we have engaged with uh, all shapes and sizes of, of businesses, from uh, from General Electric to uh, special purpose vehicles that that are designed to uh, develop a, a single project that maybe have a staff of five uh, and have a you know a very narrow and and. and and circumscribed kind of development ambition, um, and all points along that spectrum as as well. Uh, we too have uh, criteria like uh, XMs, where we will want to understand the the uh, the, the size, scope, and, and scale um, of the the ambition uh, of the of the enterprise that we're considering extending this funding to. We'll want to understand that they've done it before, or at least that they have some some relevant uh, credentials that they can call on. Uh, we will subject them also to a, a rigorous due diligence process. Uh, we will need to see. Uh, 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 sort of robust um, financial documentation. We'll need to understand the, the makeup of their um, executive board, who their investors are, um, in order to ensure that that the uh, sort of the the, the parameters of, of this organization you know align in a general way with the with with the um, the development mission of, of USTDA. Uh, and otherwise, our, our criteria really align pretty well with uh, with Exxon uh, banks. And Rashonda. Okay. Um, for OPIC, we invest in large businesses as well as small and medium enterprise um, enterprises. In the department that I work in, Smith, we focus only on small to medium enterprises. And the way that we define that is, you know, enterprises with annual revenues of less than four hundred million dollars, or um, we can also define that by the size of the organization in terms of the number of employees. So if you have 500 or fewer employees, you know, we would consider you to be an SME as well. And as long as you uh, meet our eligibility criteria, we are, you know, happy to, to support your project. Wonderful. Time is now up, and thank you so much for the wonderful questions and answers in today's event, and a special thank you to Ben, David, and Rashonda for being with us today. Just as a reminder, the Be On Demand for all viewing within a week, and we'll send out the additional information in that email. If you're interested in attending more ADP events, please be sure to visit our website, www.africabusinessportal.com, and webinars to register or learn more about Africa Business Portal. And thank you again for joining in. And thank you, Ben. You're to quite welcome, Lee. Thank you. And thank you, Rashonda. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you, David. Thank you.